In chapter three of his book, Consciousness and the Brain, Deciphering How the Brain Codes Our Thoughts, Stanislas Dayan tackles the question of the function of consciousness. What is conscious awareness for and why do we have it? He begins by talking about the fact that before the 19th century, most scientists and philosophers talked about natural phenomena and natural objects using the concept of telos or purpose. The idea was that if you could figure out the purpose that a particular thing was meant to fulfill, then you would come to an understanding of the essence of the thing in question. Now, this talk of purposiveness, which is also known as teleology, came to an end, according to Diane, in the 19th century with the publication of Darwin's book on the origin of species. By most accounts, Darwin's largely atheistic, naturalistic outlook entirely removed all talk of purposiveness and teleology from our understanding of nature, leaving us with a relatively mechanistic understanding of the processes that are responsible for the creation of the vast diversity of plants and animals that we see in the world today. This means, according to Diane, that if we nowadays want a naturalistic, largely Darwinian account of consciousness, we need to ask a Darwinian question, which is, what is the function of consciousness? Now, some people argue that consciousness, in fact, does not have any specific function. They are known as epiphenomenalists, simply because they don't really believe that consciousness is something that has causal power in the natural world. Diane disagrees with this view, and he believes that consciousness is a real biological Darwinian phenomenon that performs certain functions. So what are they? He identifies three. The first one, and arguably the most important one, is that conscious awareness allows us to resolve what Diane calls perceptual ambiguities. When we perceive the world, when we open our eyes or open our ears, or when we touch the world uh, with our skin, we get a lot of information about the world, but we don't get all the information that we need. Sometimes perception gives us information that is quite limited and our brains have the task of having to fill in the gaps. They have to fill in the rest, that which is not given. We see one example of this filling in function in what neuroscientists call the aperture problem. So imagine that you have an aperture in a doorway, so a hole in a wall or in a door, and you're seeing through it. And behind that hole, you see a stick, in this case, a pen, that is moving in a particular direction. So here is the hole, and then you see a stick that is moving in a particular direction. Now, you know right now which direction it's moving because you have access to the movement of my hand and the movement of the pen. But if you only had the information that is available here, it's actually impossible to know whether the pen is moving up and down or left and right. Now, again, it's kind of difficult to do with poor visual aids, but this is known as the aperture problem. And the point here is that sometimes we only have access to the information that is in the hole, and yet we can tell without any difficulty whether the object is moving up and down or left and right. So how is that possible? This is because our brain performs this critical function of filling in the gaps and taking the information that is available to it in order to reconstruct what it thinks is the most likely explanation for the phenomena in question. So the brain is constantly performing what is known as Bayesian inferences. Now, Bayesian inferences are simply statistical computations whereby the brain takes certain data, like the information that we have in terms of the movement of the stick through the hole, and then makes an inference backwards. Given what I see, what is the most likely thing that must be happening? So this backwards reconstruction of what must be the case such that I see what I currently see 
is known as a Bayesian inference. It is also known as an abduction um, to differentiate it from induction and deduction. So you have induction where you go from uh, particulars to universals. You have deduction where you go from universals to particulars. And then you have this third thing called abduction where you go from a set of particulars to the best possible explanation of those particulars. And abductive reasoning is extremely common in the natural sciences. According to Diane, our brain is a natural scientist because it's constantly performing these functions as a way of constructing a model of reality on the basis of somewhat limited data points. That's the first function of consciousness. It is consciousness that performs these Bayesian inferences and gives us that unified field of conscious awareness that for us counts as reality itself. Now, the second thing that conscious awareness does on Diane's account is that it creates what Diane calls working memory. You can think about working memory almost as a temporal workspace, as a space in the mind that allows the brain to hold particular pieces of information in mind for an extended period of time. So, for example, if I tell you, think about this pen, look at it, look at it from all angles, you can do so, you can gather information, and then you can keep that information in mind for seconds, minutes, hours, maybe days, and then you can recall that information. More importantly, you can use that information to make all kinds of cognitive maneuvers, to talk about the pen, to make inferences about the pen, so on and so forth. According to Diane, that kind of keeping in mind for, a, for an extended period of time uh, in working memory is something that only conscious entities can do. A key piece of evidence that Diane uses to support his theory of working memory as necessarily conscious is research on eye reflex conditioning. Now, this research is a little bit too technical for me to go into great detail here, so I recommend that you look up the book and look at the details, but the basic idea is the following. Imagine that you're a scientist and you bring a number of research subjects into your laboratory, and then you subject them to the following experiment. You sit them down, then you put a machine in their eyes that releases a puff of air into the eyeball. If you've been to the ophthalmologist or the optometrist, you know what I'm talking about. Now imagine that once the machine is implanted, you then play a sound. And as you're playing the sound, like a tone, beep, then they get a puff of air in the eye. Of course, the puff of air will trigger a reaction that's going to lead to the closing of the eyelids. Now, if you do this enough, beep, air puff, closing of the eyes, Eventually, the subject will develop an unconscious automatic reaction. It, it, it will be a conditioned reaction. They will start closing their eyes at the very moment they hear the sound, even if the puff of air has not actually taken place. And all of this will be unconscious. You will play the sound, they will close their eyes, and then if you ask them, did you close your eyes and why? They will say, no, what are you talking about? I am not aware of anything going on. Now, Diane points out that if we tweak the parameters of the study and we introduce a temporal gap between the moment that we play the sound, the beep, and the moment that we release the puff of air to the eyeballs, we see a major difference. Namely, we see a transition from unconscious to conscious perception. If you train people to listen to a beep, then there is a gap of time so that they don't overlap. And then you release the air. They will also learn to close their eyes at the very sound of the beep. But the difference is that the closing of the eyelids will no longer be automatic and unconscious. By now, we've seen that there are at least two functions that consciousness performs. One of them is the resolution of perceptual ambiguities, as in the case of the aperture problem. And the second one is the creation of the working memory space that allows us to hold things in mind. A third function that Diane talks about in chapter three is what he calls running of algorithms. And it's closely related to holding things in mind. 
In fact, it is because we can hold things in mind in this common mental global space. So you can almost imagine a working table where you can put a lot of information and then you can arrange them and rearrange them as well, at will. Because we have that, we are able to construct entire sequences of cognitive activity. In other words, we can create algorithms. Now, what does it mean to run these algorithms? The best way to think about this is to use the example of a simple calculation. Imagine that I tell you, multiply 50 by 25. Now, that's not so easy, but if you take some time, you can figure it out, even without pen or pencil. You can just think about it, and after a few minutes, you will figure out the answer. And if I ask you how you got to the answer, you'll be able to recall the steps that you took. I don't know, maybe I first multiply 50 by 10, and then I did it again to get to 20, and then again and divided it in half and added that, and that's how I got to 50 times 25. Now, the fact that we're able to take an operation, get the conclusion of that operation or the result, and then plug the result into a next step of calculation and so on and so forth, that's what Diane means by running of algorithms. Now, you might remember from the previous video that Diane also argues that we can do math unconsciously, that there is unconscious math. But he clarifies that most mathematical operations that happen unconsciously are relatively simplistic. We're just talking about the recognition of numbers, magnitudes, maybe simple addition and subtraction, basic multiplication. When you're talking about more complicated mathematical operations that require multiple steps, that's what you cannot do unconsciously. That requires conscious awareness because you have to create an algorithm in which each step feeds into the next one. So now we have a third function of consciousness, which is the running of these sequential calculations. The final function of consciousness that Diane talks about in this book is reportability. In other words, linkage. He argues that it is because we are conscious of our surroundings and because we are able to hold things in memory and because we're able to create chains of reasoning, that we're able to have language, which in itself is nothing more than the creation of a chain of verbal signs that reflect a certain thought. Now, where does all of this leave us in terms of our understanding of consciousness? It means first and foremost that consciousness is a real biological phenomenon. It is something that exists, that has evolved over deep phylogenetic time, and that is subject to Darwinian laws of natural selection. And it is not an illusion as a number of neuroscientists and philosophers have argued. Secondarily, it means that consciousness performs certain functions that only consciousness can perform and that differentiate conscious entities from unconscious entities. And those are the resolution of perceptual ambiguities, the creation of working memory, the running of algorithms, and finally, the possibility of linkage.